And as we always do, we begin with Wordsworth, and we now have a new curator for our poets, who is Brian uh, McGuigan, and he works at uh, Richard Hugo House and is also the editor uh, of When It Rains from the Ground Up and producer of Night of Cheap Wine and Poetry. I like that title. Um, McGuigan is the author of, uh, of the poetry collection More Than I Left Behind from Spangstraw Press of 2006. And Brian, do you want to say any additional words about yourself before you read your poetry? Sure, sure, sure. Actually, I'd like to say a few words about the, the curation, actually. Okay, great. Um, since this is my uh, first time doing the uh, Wordsworth, I'd like to say a few words about my plans for the, uh, the series. Uh, I was looking through the, the website at the archives of the past poets that have been here, and I realized that a lot of them were part of uh, the academic style of poetry. So my goal as a curator here will be to bring uh, working class poets, people who are teachers, cab drivers, secretaries, paper pushers, just regular folks who happen to also be poets. So that's my goal here. And I'll just get right into the poem, which is entitled, What We Forget When We Remember an Address. And it seems fitting, given uh, what we've been talking about, or what will be talked about at the council meeting today. <clears throat> the air is clear, except for the dust, from the building going up, one of many around here. The workers are busy with talk of the weekend, who got some or didn't, and who won the big game. It was all the same each Monday, like alarm clock stopped and lucky charm zip locked, pushing kids out the door. You could see it on the second floor in the unit with no windows yet, beside the one where the carpenter sets the studs, where a man will throw darts to the wall chips and he's evicted and someone new moves in, plays music all night, maybe Marla, maybe Madonna, he hasn't decided. No one will sleep. The cats of the alley will creep in the bushes till sunlight comes. Then they'll stretch on the cement, not there long before. Cattle grazed and water went ways it's supposed. And man followed with thoughts of only those things that kept him going. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, Catherine LeBeau. Hello. Catherine, if you want to say a few words about yourself, you're welcome. Absolutely. To um, I grew up in Vancouver, Washington. Went to college up in Bellingham, graduated a couple of years ago. I've moved to Seattle, and now I work as the receptionist and um, volunteer coordinator for the Richard Hugo House. Write for the Willamette Week, and I write poetry, um, which I brought today. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Rainier, Maria. It's after a poem by Carrie Wayson, another Seattle poet. Her poem that she wrote was after a poem by Frederico Garcia Lorca, so this is kind of a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, hers was about green, mine is about gray, and kind of all the, especially about the weather and all the moods you associate with it. And the weather cooperated with me today, as you can see. <laughs> Rainier Maria. Gray, I need you gray. I need your gray goose in the fat morning. Saw clouds, Morgan loons, shopping cart a twist on the curb. Gray, greet the hollow in my handshake. Be my concrete cataract, my shoestring heart attack. And gray, if you must be stormy, I want my own storm. Give me your wool perfume, your cheap room. Gray, I want your oatmeal. I want your sandy eye, your railroad tie, the glitter in your intersection, bitter snort of booze, your soup kitchen, funnel capped floozy, refusing the cream of mushroom. Gray, I say Maria. I say God, fud, God flood, cozy mud. Give me your best emergency. Say your lamest joke, bucket laugh, braying. Gray, I hear you gray, a mossy rain cloud boredom. I mean your steel at garbage time. I mean, I need your buck. Gray, I need your candor in the clover of my luck. Gray, I need you gray. I need you gray. I need a towel. Gray, please wipe the wet from your crooked hairpin smile. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> Curated by Brian McGuigan. And Brian, you want to introduce the poet today? Sure, sure. Today's poet is uh, Harvey Goldner. 
Uh, Harvey lives in Seattle, which according to him is perhaps the world's most beautiful city whenever the sun is shining, which is rarely. His poems have appeared widely in various journals, print and online, both in North America and the UK. His most recent chapbook, Her Bright Bottom, was published by Spankster Press. A collection of his poems, The Resurrection of Bert Ringgold, is forthcoming from Cinco Puntos Press in the autumn of 2007. And uh, Harvey is probably one of the finest poets we have here in Seattle, if you ask me. Harvey? <clears throat> kind of a little cold, so uh, do the best I can. It's called Emerald Sink City Blues. Because Seattle is so sad, so slow, we slurp cup after cup of espresso and frequently force ourselves to go to clubs and shows which feature local comedians and loco bozo jokes of rock and rap and roll. But even so, it's no go. Even after much pounding of laughter and many bitter drafts of caffeine, we still feel sad and slow. So what's the deal? Why, in spite of our brave efforts, do we feel so low? What power drags our collective ego down so? The sloppy weather? No, I don't think so. Some grave phenomenon sinks us even amid brief summers hot green and gold. You know, it's the Norwegians. Yes, somewhere in Ballard, perhaps in a tavern, so a dozen or so Norwegians who, dreaming as one, generate a magnetic mood so heavy and icy blue that neither I, you, nor your mama could possibly stand up and mumbo under it. But what can we do? What can we do short of exploding our brains with Colt 45s or taking graceful swan dives off the aurora or spiking our caffeine with amphetamine or moving to Florida's Okefenokee or Arizona or even southern God, no, California. <laughs> you know, we can form a committee and take up a collection to send those dozen or so Norwegians to a farmhouse outside Fargo, North Dakota, in the middle of nowhere, hopefully below six feet of snow, where those Norwegians can amuse themselves, but under quarantine. And yeah, I think I'll go too. Thank you, Harvey. Very interesting poem, but uh, on behalf of Norwegians everywhere. Uh, this is a Felicia's bio. Born and raised in Cuba, Felicia Gonzalez has had work published in several anthologies, including Word Thursdays. In 2006, she was a recipient of the Mayor's Office Arts, of Cultural, Arts and Cultural Affairs Artist Award, and her chapbook, Re Recollection Graffiti, is forthcoming. Felicia? <laughs> thank you, Brian, mm -hmm. and thank you, Councilmember Licata. Well, it's wonderful to be able to be here and to read on such a sunny day. And uh, the weather in this poem is actually quite different than what we have today. This is entitled Ripple Effect. Getting on, asked the bus driver. Slowly up the three steps, she reached for the fare, feeling shells among the coins. Getting to a seat seemed to take forever. She could sense the driver's frustration, his urge to keep on schedule. Motor belched as soon as she'd worked her way behind the plexiglass divider near the back door. It was before eight in the morning. Passengers wore sleep across their faces. She picked up the scent of soap and shampoo, fake clean. On the roof of a warehouse, rain from last night's storm formed a lake, reflected sky, telephone lines, nearby trees. Still, except for vibrations along the surface from the building's heating and cooling system. 
Sometimes I'll just sit there having singles, sometimes doubles. The man, rumpled and derelict, said, Turns out he was talking about espresso, sometimes with whipped cream, he smiled. The bus was coming slowly around the west side of the hill. Dirt and pebbles lay across the road, debris from the storm. A passenger was telling the driver how on the news they said, sometime during the storm, part of the bay had gone missing. They were now on the bridge. From the bus, it didn't seem as high. She had been afraid it would make her nauseous to be suspended in the air like this. The view from Yesler and Boren was a surprise. Water looked higher than the road, and from this angle, Smith Tower appeared to be half as tall, sitting in the bay like an old man fishing, his hat pulled over his ears. They were moving quickly. She wasn't sure which stop would be the right one, never having seen the city from this vantage point. People on their way to work jumped off the bus at every corner, hurried through doors that swung open as they neared. When the freshly showered scent was replaced by brine and echoes of fish, she knew this was the stop. The bus rocked gently back and forth on its tires on the steep street facing the bay. It took her some time to collect herself, work her way out of the seat, down the steps at the back door. She thanked the driver by waving to him in the tiny mirror above the door, noticing how it resembled a fish scale. She moved to the end of the pavement and tumbled forward, rejoining the rest of the bay. Staring at the city from this familiar view, directing ripples toward the street, she wondered how the evening news would report the return of the bay. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Very nice. Today we have uh, John Burgess, who I've known since the uh, Seattle Poet Populist competition, where he's the runner-up to the current Poet Populist, Jordan Keith. Is your microphone on, by the way? Make sure that light's on at the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got green okay. here. Very good. All right. So uh, John will be reading at the uh, Seattle Poetry Festival on April 21st, which will be at Hugo House, and then he'll also be at Burning Word, which is uh, Saturday, April 28th. And that's um, on the east side, it would be Island. Um, John grew up in upstate New York, uh, worked on a survey crew in Montana, taught English in Japan, and now lives and works in Seattle. He's a 2006 Jack Straw writer and co-founder of Washington Poets Association Burning Word Festival. His first book is Punk, punk Poems from Ravenna Press, and I'll say uh, Punk Poems is a really good book. John? Hey, thanks. Yeah, sure. <laughs> there is no myth in his life. For five blocks, he wonders how the elk got there. The only way into the city from the mountains is Interstate 90, so he guesses they took the commuter lane, rode someone's bumper all the way to town, used their antlers as horns. When he spots them, they're grazing the green belt at the north end of the community college. His peripheral vision catches the sandy brown of elk hide against the row of poplar trees that buffers traffic noise. They're chewing as if counting to 15 before swallowing. Everything else rushes by too fast to notice the care they're taking. In fact, by the time he stops at the traffic light just five blocks away, he's no longer sure he even saw elk. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, today's poet is uh, Chris Dusterhoff. Chris was born and raised in the land of John Waters, Divine, Roe Holmes, and Big Hair. He moved to the Pacific Northwest and began Spankster Press in 1998. He has published chapbooks by Todd Moore, Harvey Goldner, Majed Zaire, Brian McGuigan, Larry Coffin, Eli Richardson, David Leterre, Ira Pornes, and Oni Peel, and is working on a book by Lorraine Campbell. Here you go, Chris. Uh, thank you, Brian. It's an honor to be here to uh, read my poem. Uh, it shouldn't take long. It's about, uh, it's about 20 years old, so forgive me if it's a little high school seniorish. It's called A Long Time Ago. <clears throat> a long time ago when the graveyard was full of our graves and the can wanted to be kicked into sarcasm <coughs> and spastic night, the whole lot of us would go into the yard between bedtimes and fireflies, and the two streams we called hello and goodbye because of their prophecies. Usually about ten altogether, and hide and run and kick and breathe and love the sky and those who breathed it with us. 
Then the seven of us would feed the bats with pebbles and play badminton with the lightning bugs. And the neighbors didn't like us three marching down the neighborhood, singing Cajun songs in a waltz-type fashion. So they yelled, they yelled, those screen door savages, that I shouldn't be out alone when the streets were waking and the weatherman predicted death and a slight chance of showers before morning. Thank you very much. Why well, would you like to introduce our poet today? Sure, sure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, today's poet, I'm honored to have uh, Rajni Eddins. Uh, I've known Rajni through the poetry community for a couple of years now. We were both uh, Poet Populist nominees a couple of years back. And besides being a, a great poet, Rajni is a real entertainer, so I appreciate having him today. I'm going to read his bio for you all. Rajni Eddins is a talented poet, singer-songwriter, performance artist, and teacher. He is the co-founder of the Poetry Experience, an organization he began with his mother, Randy Eddins, in 1998. Rajni has performed at more than 300 different venues, including festivals, theaters, poetry slams, colleges, universities, cafes, bookstores, and a wide variety of schools. As a teacher, Rajni works with many at-risk youth from grade school through high school, creating and implementing curriculums that teach nonviolence through poetry and spoken word, which serve to deconstruct media stereotypes, reaffirm self-identity, and improve self-esteem. Rajni? Thank you, Nick. Let's see, the piece I'd like to share is called Know This. It's in dedication to our children. Know this. Your lives are the jewels we shine light through. Your struggles are, your triumphs are, what make you many faceted. These rays of light tinged with your lives colored the world your chosen kaleidoscopic door to open. My peers, my people, young brothers and sisters, elders, sages and seers, cast off your fears so that you may take flight unarrested. Only law we break is gravity, unprotested. Follow me through these veins of inner vision where more than your imagination could defy description. This be blueprint to our dreams as living where impossibility is the only possibility that can't be conjured. And since can't ain't in our vocabulary, cannot can be conquered. Understand me, mama? Understand me, brother? Yes, we understand each other. So let's grant each other's wishes like family love had dreamt this. What majesty is set for these scholars, scientists, philosophers, and cultural anthropologists, rebels with righteous causes, armed with pebbles to ripple ponds and topple giants of mind with, like David and Goliath? For we are legion of lion-hearted, generation of regeneration. Peace be our target. We have you in our sights. The torch is passed to us. We choose to birth the force of love. Making wings out of crack fiends, resurrected crack dreams is how we stack cream. For we are legion of lion-hearted, generation of regeneration. Peace be our target. We have you in our sights. The torch is passed to us. We will not choose to scorch the earth to dust. Thank you, Rajan. Also, uh, this is your second time reading here, and you may have been the first person, perhaps, to read it uh, at our, uh, at our uh, Wordsworth. So, yeah, thank I'm you. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll move on to the third item. When she was declared, when she declared herself a resident poet, she was locked up in a military psych ward for being under the delusion that she's a poet. Krista has been writing poetry ever since. Uh, she's been a, a great staple of the Seattle literary community for quite some time, and I'm honored to have her here today. Krista. Thank you, Brian. Um, this poem is dedicated to veterans, all veterans, and especially veterans of the Iraq War coming back now. It's called His Self-Portrait. A self-portrait hangs above him as he sleeps restlessly on the mattress. His legs kick like a horse's, pawing the dirt clump, clump, tangled in a blue quilt. In the portrait, his face glows orange, the background purple, the complementary colors of a sunset in Vietnam. But the eyes, the eyes, and the heart he painted black below the left breast suffer the sorrow of a drafted man who didn't want to kill and later met the refugees, strung electric wire for the relatives of those he bombed. His legs ran away with his dreams, tangled in the blue quilt of night. I woke once to my husband, bare-ass naked on all fours, pawing the wooden floor with his bowie knife. 
I called him out of sleep as he fought the dreamed enemy. And later, fully awake, he walked into the woods with a bottle of whiskey and all his pills. After three months, a father and his son were looking for fossils and found his bones. My lover's eyes are closed tonight beneath blankets, and though he is not at peace, I will let him sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, today's poet is Oni Peel. Uh, you might honored. speak right into the microphone. So you can oh, sure, me. sure. Same How about now? Can you hear me now? There all you right. go. We're all good. I'm uh, really honored to have uh, Oni here today. I've known him for about as long as I've lived in Seattle, and he's uh, definitely one of my favorite poets. He uh, talks about lots of different things in his poems, but he does it in a way that just makes it seem very real and honest and, and plain spoken, which is something that I can appreciate just being a regular guy. Uh, Ani is a carpenter and a poet. He believes that the impulse to create is the most fundamental and vital human characteristic, even though he doesn't always do right by it. When he wakes up in the morning, he feels like his body is new, the world is new, the only things old at all are memory and the ways he responds to interaction. He is sure there's a psychological term for this phenomenon, but he hasn't looked it up yet. He's not that kind of poet. He has published three books, Girls, 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 Deck Hand Alm, and Montana. His newest manuscript, The New Biology, recently received its first rejection letter. Tony? Thanks. Uh, this piece is called The New Biology. <clears throat> it was almost completely ignorable at first. A new variety of sandworm on a distant beach in Argentina. A type of cricket never seen before in a far corner of Ethiopia. Only a handful of biologists noticed. Then on an isolated rock in the Hawaiian archipelago, there appeared hermit crabs with strange golden claws that wore the bodies of sea anemones, whole rainbows of new seaweeds, 12 fin minnows, undocumented squid. People began to pay attention, but it was too late. New species began popping up everywhere, under rocks, on the no-man division lands between directions on freeways, in the backs of cupboards, in old cereal boxes. Now every locker room has fungi that defy classification. The evening choir of frogs has all kinds of new voices. Bird songs can hardly be recognized in Twitter at unfamiliar hours. Vines like ribbons, shoestrings, serpents with berries like agates, saltwater taffy, blue glass, and flowers like bells, hummingbirds, and perfect genitalia crowd walkways, consume backyards, bus shelters, neglected bicycles. Carpets have been lost to moss thick as carpets. Trees eat up concrete with roots like green teeth. There is a salamander on my windowsill with orange eyes and purple feet who whispers, Saturday, Saturday, for impenetrable reasons when I'm trying to sleep. The word genesis is an overused media buzzword. It's lost all religious connotation. There's some heavy genesis east of the bridge this morning, backed up across the water, find another route. Hey man, did you see that genesis last night? Yeah, dude. People are mystified. It's not what they signed up for. All that talk of extinctions. They feel kind of cheated. They laugh maniacally and weep. They drink too much. They lock themselves in and rarely leave. And worst of all is the talk, all the nervous chatter, stupid questions, and wild speculation. God, what I wouldn't give for normal conversation. Thank you very much. As we usually do, we begin with the uh, Wordsworth, curated by Brian McGuigan. And Brian, would you introduce our the poet populace today? Sure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, today's poet is Jordan Keith, who is uh, Seattle's poet populist. I brought her here today not only because she's one of my favorite poets, but she's also one of my favorite people in this city. Um, Jordan's always happy to see everybody, always got a nice smile on her face. She's just a real positive person, and I'm happy to have her here today. Uh, Jordan, as I said, is the Seattle's 2007 Seattle Poet Populist and Storyteller and is a Jack Straw writer and Hedgebrook alum, a 2004 grant recipient from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs for the choreo poem The Uterine Files, Episode 1, Voices Spitting Out Rainbows. Her publication credits include Colors Northwest, Seattle Woman, 
When it rains from the ground up, KUW, the video, Silence Broken, and the anthology, Maka, Diasporic Chucks. She is the founder of Urban Wilderness Project, which provides storytelling, restoration, and adventure programs for youth and adults. Joda? Thank you. Um, I wanted to share a poem that's uh, mixed between a Japanese form. It's called, it's a high bun, a little haiku and a story for you. It's called a climax species. Roots knuckle. The fight against concrete breaks out. Red fists bloom as roses. It happened slowly. No one even noticed at first. The rust is what gave it away. Along the ridge line where the topography had been changed from uneven terrain and wooded slopes to simple flattened terraces that made for stairs and condo complexes, trees were turning the strangest colors. Perhaps it was the development, disturbed soils, always brought a change even in the evergreen state, but the trees were turning red and brown in the oddest places and in the wrong seasons. Bill and Lucy noticed it first. Uncle Bill had always taken Lucy for walks. She was the oldest dog in King County, and rumor had it, so was he. It was like watching Alice fall into the rabbit hole when Lucy disappeared, a beautiful black lab of 101 years old, gone just like that. That's how the papers reported it, even though Uncle Bill had told them that that wasn't how it happened. He'd even called the editor of the Issaquah Times himself. Somebody's built a tunnel or a road or something, I'm telling you. That's where Lucy is. Isn't that illegal? No signs or anything? No one called him back. No one seemed to investigate. He left more messages. She's lost in the tunnels, I'm telling you. I know my old girl. She knows the scent of all these woods. She knows my voice. It was the rust that gave it away when Uncle Bill was taken to the Overlake Clinic with his arm slashed open. All the trees are sculptures, I'm telling you, metal, bronze, or silver, supposed to look like trees, like when moss oxidizes them, or like aspirins or alders, I'm telling you. He was hysterical. That's what they said. Poor man. He loved that dog. He's old, and he's gone mad. But it was the rust that gave the trees away, the rust that infected his cut, the rust that poisoned his blood 17 years since his last tetanus shot, Lockjaw, cause of death. There was an investigation. We sued the hospital. They won. How could anyone be expected to believe that the trees were bronze? Our team of lawyers found the tunnels. New Earth Lungs is what the Times named them. New Earth. The machines had large HEPA filters, and they breathed out of the tunnel stacks. They were designed to look like evergreens, hemlocks, wispy needle arms, that leads, that always been a climax species. We had finally figured it out. Homeless, hemlocks touch highways. Green fingers bend to reach humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. I feel uh, very grateful to have uh, J.T. Stewart here as today's poet. She's uh, one of my favorite people in the city and just a, a great woman. JT is a poet, writer, playwright, and editor whose work as a public artist includes poetry broadsides and Raven Brings Light to This House of Stories, a commissioned collaborative permanent art exhibit in the Paul Allen Library at the UW. Her other collaborative work includes co-editing Gathering Ground, New Writing and Art by Northwest Women of Color, and Seattle Poets and Photographers, A Millennium Reflection, which is this very fine book here. JT is the 2006 curator of the Jack Straw Writers Program, and as a performance artist, has appeared in a number of venues, including National Public Radio, Bumbershoot, Seattle's Downtown Public Library, Elliott Bay Books, and these series, After Long Silence, North Seattle Community College, and my own, A Night of Cheap Wine and Poetry. JT? Hello, everybody. Is your microphone on? Make sure that it, uh, it's clicked on. Nope, no green light. Oh, there it is. Okay. Got it. I'll try it again. Okay. I, there we go. <laughs> hello, everybody. As a writer, people ask me very frequently, well, what does it take to be a writer? And sometimes I'll give a sort of flippant answer, and sometimes I'll take, give a really serious answer. 
So I'm going to give you a serious answer in case you've thought about this. Okay. I believe that in order to be a writer, you need a good memory, you need a good imagination, and above all, you need courage. I'll say that again, courage, courage. The poem that I'm going to read today is from a collection that I call From Love on the Rocks Yet Again. And that will give you an idea of the tone of this piece. It's called One of These Days. Wash his shorts, clip his toenails, fumigate his socks, throw out his beer bottles, lie about your black eye, thank him for the flowers, remind him to shave, get him a new elegant watch, tell him you still love him, lie about your swollen face, thank him for the flowers, wait on him in coffee shops, learn to watch bowl games on HDTV, iron his shorts and his t-shirts, threaten to move out, lie to your few remaining friends, break all the good dishes, hide most of his credit cards, look for something to burn, lie to your therapist, find a new cosmetic surgeon, buy more candles and incense, lie about your broken thumb, thank him for the flowers, take gourmet cooking classes, memorize exotic wine lists, find new homes for your cats, thank him for the flowers, buy a discreet handgun, lie to your therapist, sleep with your gun under your pillow, dream of your next confrontation, pull out your gun, stand with your back to the wall, hesitate, aim for his head, hesitate, aim for his heart, hesitate, ask him once more to explain himself, hear him say, you know I don't mean it, you know I love you, tell him next time you'll shoot, I will shoot you next time, lower the gun, wait for him to smile, put the gun away, wait for his flowers, lie to your therapist. Thank you. Appreciate it. Today, Ira Pons, Pones grew up on the verdant banks of the Delaware River in Milford, New Jersey. He has worked mainly as a roofer in the greatest Seattle area since 1993. Mr. Pones has a degree in public art from the University of Washington and is a combat veteran of the global war on terrorism. His poetry has been frequently published in the independent presses of Seattle, and he has written two collected works, Olympian Low Road by uh, So Many Birds Publishing and Fever Dream by Spankshire Press. Ira? Thanks. I live in a field of high pressure systems. Infinite voltage in a dangerous drain basin. This is like a windshield to a whiteout or a car wash time machine. You go in, 10 a.m., you come out, and it's dusk. The grass has a supernatural glow to its green like a cemetery lawn on chrome film. This actually happens to people. I got here because I could not read or write, but someone fixed my teeth at an early age, gave me chlorine pills and a 60-foot length of bait hose. Now I own the bait hose factory. If you want in on the glory, it isn't hard. Just hear my tapes each day, and we'll build a bridge to Eastern Bloc galaxies. They park at the intersection of 85th and Aurora, right there by Jack in the Box. I pass it now in my night flights in a world they can't touch. We can all have this, deep sweaters and a sunburn 
essential oils and alpine instruments, a neglected bassoon and a flugelhorn welded to a single shot Italian 12 gauge. My red windbreaker is a lightning rod for open hearted ministrations on the avenue. If you see me, wave so I know there are more of us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. I'm very happy to have uh, my coworker and very good Could friend. Could you make sure you speak right into the microphone? Oh, yeah, sure. How about now? I think you still can't hear me? Huh. No, I actually, I think they are working. Hmm. Huh. Speak fully into the microphone. Uh, best we I can will do. try my best. Thank you. <laughs> so, thanks, Nick. I'm very happy to have uh, my coworker and very good. Could you friend. make sure you speak right into the microphone? Oh yeah, sure. How about now? I think you still can't hear me. Huh? No, I actually, I think they are working. Hmm. Well, huh. Speak fully into the microphone. Uh, best we can I will do. try my best. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm very happy to have uh, Katinka Kraft here today. She's a good friend of mine and co-worker. Uh, Katinka is a German-American spoken word poet and multimedia performance artist. She approaches words with the fusion of song, voice, body, and rhythm. Katinka graduated from Western Washington with a degree in multimedia performance art, <laughs> cultural studies, and youth advocacy. As co-director of Oratrix Productions, she has both produced and performed in tours nationally and internationally, including theaters, festivals, cafes, and universities. She is the author of a self-published collection of poetry titled Who Will Write the History of Tears and is featured on the 2003 Oratrix CD. Her most current artistic endeavor took her to Poland and Germany, where she directed and filmed a feature-length documentary with The Descendants Project. She has been an arts educator in private secondary institutions for the last three years and is currently employed as a teacher and director of facilities at Richard Hugo House. Katinka? I wrote this piece in response to my German ancestry, in response to the U.S. invasion of Af Afghanistan, the U.S. invasion of Iraq. I wrote this piece in response to post-September 11th racism. Er hatte Angst um seine Kinder. My grandfather was a soldier for Hitler's regime. He didn't believe in the word of the Führer. He was a quiet man, afraid for his children. Deutschland war die große Macht. My great granduncle built weapons for the Nazis with a sharp mind. He was a proud man building powerful tools for what he believed was a great nation. After the war, he was transferred to the United States where he became a rich man building Nazi weapons for what was to be the next great nation. Sie hatte Angst. My grandmother was a woman in denial. She shook her head at my father's angry question. Her answer was, wir wussten es nicht. We just didn't know. As a child, I stood on tiptoes, attempting to peer above graffiti-stained walls that divided my city into two halves, a shield of clouds hovering above a concrete structure that stretched itself far above my searching eyes. As a child, I used to spend hours spinning tales in my mind, imagining that I was alive during my grandfather's time. Images of Jewish girls pinned with gold stars on frail chests flooded my thoughts. There were steel trains filled with hungry eyes that passed through cold cities and burnt bodies filled lungs with smoke. Smoke that billowed through empty streets. I imagined cold nights and closed doors, neighbors that peered through closed curtains. I held my breath. How is it possible that these monsters were human? Hi Hitler! A German soldier pinned with swastika on right shoulder, marching. Hi Hitler! My ancestors were monsters. Am I a monster? As a child, I held my breath, hoping I would have been a good soul under Hitler's hand. I knew better. Fear makes monsters. I spent most of my childhood afraid. In sixth grade, I was officially a German-born American. Accent and all, I started middle school in the United States. I was riding home on a school bus one day when a kid called out, Nazi? Ich bin kein Nazi, flung from my lips. The kids laughed. It was just a joke to them, nothing to take serious. Nazis are people far away from another land, monsters of another kind. They had never wondered if a Nazi lived inside their own skin. Attach evil to a monster and you can stand separate, non-reflective of its nature. Attach evil to a human, a real flesh and bones, real heart, human, and you are forced to stand in front of a mirror. In memory, my grandfather sat across from me in a white stringed hammock on my back porch, full of joy, full of laughter. I ate cherries and told him stories. His presence was full of love for me. He 
is my monster. My ancestors taught me that the ability to hate lies dormant in our bodies, in the abandoned wing of our hearts. It can spread, can infiltrate our mind. Anytime we think we've risen above hate, it might lie closer to our hearts than we know. I was taught that the origin of hate is fear. Be wary of a country in fear. In 1933, fear spread like wildfire across Germany. In the name of economic survival, Germans hung flags from windows, cars, and storefronts. In the name of unity, a red flag painted with black swastika became the symbol for national pride. National pride paraded blindly is the kind of pride that has broken countries into shadows of people. Many Germans had believed in the promise of greatness of power of permanence that Hitler had vowed to them. After the war, they were deeply disappointed in a father who promised them safety, but brought them blood, stained hands, and silence. At the end of the war, the German people had believed that silence was survival and following orders is what they needed to do to understand chaos. There remained to only be the traces of my ancestors left on the concrete walls they built between them and history. A deep, gaping wound in the heart of the nation demands instinct to not look back, to only move forward, to force history into oblivion, to forget. I was born with the craving to remember. In my childhood neighborhood, you can still see the silver, shiny fixtures that attached Hitler's flag to the fronts of every family home. The act is a reminder of those who were eager to join the voice of unity without question, and in the process gave up the freedom to choose otherwise. By the late 1930s, Hitler's army patrolled every block and interrogated any home that stood without flag and fixture. Ken deine Geschichte. Know your history. Ask questions, my father taught me. Never stop asking questions. You put yourself in great danger if you do. Hitler Germany was a country that replaced knowing with believing. Believing in one man that would lead them out of fear and offer them protection. Hitler, their great father, be wary of a country in fear. I want to scream caution to the winds, to the tides that are made to repeat history, to myself who still lives in denial, breathes fear, and depends on something outside of myself for survival. I am crawling in my American skin. I am afraid of the monsters that were born on the day we remembered that we are afraid. Thank you. Thank you, Katina. I'm very happy to have my friend Steve Balka here today. Steve lives in Seattle, where he's an editor of the journal When It Rains From The Ground Up. He pays the bills as a copywriter for a travel webpage. Most recently, his work has appeared in Letter X Magazine, Farmhouse Magazine, and zygote in my coffee. For more information, check out www.myspace.com backslash Balka. Steve? Thank you. Somewhere on pine. Cars stacked high, blanketed in green. Cobblestone cracks filled with dead cigarettes. Plastic chairs beaten by the sun. Brick camouflaged in vine. Bush spray painted on a stop sign. Dirty men in flannel and wool share a sidewalk with youth in band t-shirts carrying books. The occasional suit walks by me and must say, there's another Seattle cliche. My smoke, my overpriced cup won't amount to much. Still, I sit in a roped off patio, taking notes slow on life, wondering if happiness comes from a dog. 2.5, a job and a wife, secretly fantasizing about screwing my secretary, not thinking about my poor bank statement or empty fridge or lack of interview clothes, or the hardworking men in trucks who wonder how I can sip coffee in the middle of a weekday with a full pack of butts. Thank you. Uh, step up to the soap. Thank you, Nick. Uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, maybe, I met Freda at Hugo House, and she said, oh, I've heard about this Wordsworth program. I really want to do it. So I said, you have to come. So I'm very happy to have Freda here today. Uh, Freda Jaffe was raised in New York City and has made a home in Seattle for the last 30 years. She received a community arts fellowship from the Earthwatch Institute to study salmon habitat restoration on the Skagit River, was a 2005 Jack Straw writer, and currently teaches in the Writers in the Schools program, and works as a family therapist in private practice. Freda? Thank you. Um, I had the experience of uh, driving uh, down Western Avenue for years, watching this big lot that turned into the 
sculpture garden. And um, I, when I went the first time to the sculpture garden, there's a place called the Vivarium, which is kind of a greenhouse with a nurse log there. And on the wall of the Vivarium are the names of naturalists, uh, 20th century naturalists. And that inspired me to start reading reading um, some of the works of some of the naturalists, and one of the books I read was Silent Spring, which was a, an explosive bestseller in 1962. Um, Rachel Carson is considered to be the, the mother of the environmental movement. So I have a quote from her, which is, knowing what I do, there would be no future peace for me if I kept silence. And this is called Breaking Silence. She was a private person, raised in a time when you write like a man was taken as compliment. When we worshiped science like some terrible god, prayed to be delivered, and we were, built bomb shelters or wished we had, crouched in classrooms for mock air drills against unseen enemies, Dr. Strangelove exhorted us to stop worrying, love what's lethal, and we did. One letter, you remember letters, from a friend in Cape Cod carried news, spraying to control those buggers, mosquitoes, birdbath filled with DDT, carcasses of songbirds, legs drawn up to breasts, beaks gaping open, Threatened bees, frogs, crickets, coyotes, rivers of death, poisons to make the Borgia's hair stand on end. No one published her articles, so she strung them together in a book, words true enough to harbor critics even today. Thank you. I'm really happy to have uh, my good friend Brendan Regan here today. Uh, Brendan was born in Iowa and grew up in Northwest Ohio. On his way to Seattle, he lived in Toledo and Denver. His work has appeared in Chronogram, Thunder Sandwich, When It Rains From the Ground Up, Utopia Magazine, and more. Brendan? Thank you. This poem is called How We Embezzle Moments. The epigram is by Allen Ginsberg and reads, How pay rent and stay in our bodies? if we don't sell our minds to samsara. We shove and struggle to be healthy against the world, to know our place and work, to see growth and direction, get silent long enough to think about what we want of God, get convinced by wind to forgive ourselves or anyone, pay the biosphere back for supporting our functions, decide if cats are kids enough, Listen to that thrum of life. Replace our topsoil or habits. We sit in meetings with Samsara Incorporated to eat and feed the young, but steal moments like this. We duck into janitor closets, under desks, in empty cubicles, in the parking lot, out on the loading dock. We plunder the many corporations' assets of time and define the next history. The geese migrate to watch us snatch advantage. Weeds break concrete. Thank you very much for that. Thank you.